Hi, this is Mark at LearnHowToGarden.com and in today's episode of the 10 Minute Gardener we're actually going to be in my mum's 10 minute garden. And the whole concept of the 10 Minute Gardener is that my mum has decided at her age she will spend no more than 10 minutes a day in her small back vegetable garden uh, with her small greenhouse producing food that she wants to. Before we get to today's episode, if you're not already a subscriber to LearnHowToGarden.com pop over to our channel the links below this video and you can subscribe all it will cost you is your email address and that gives you monthly uh, updates on what to plant in the garden what we're doing in the garden recipe ideas and also one or two sort of videos that are in this sort of public domain that as a subscriber you get to see on sort of aspects of gardening and so I'll give you a second to do that and then when we get back we'll start by going around the greenhouse in the 10 minute garden Welcome back. I'm really fortunate. I've got a polytunnel, quite a big polytunnel, which is where we do quite a bit of the filming on the allotment because it's easier. But my mum, like a lot of people, has a small greenhouse. Hers is a little six by eight foot greenhouse. She bought it second hand, oh, countless years ago. And a lot of good practice says you shouldn't grow things together and you shouldn't put this next to that. When you've got six feet by eight feet, you grow what you want to eat and you have to put things together. So we're going to do a quick sort of tour of my mum's greenhouse and just show you what she manages to fit into a really small space. She spends no more than 10 minutes a day in the garden itself. So watering this, you know, she will do probably twice a week and it'll take her two minutes. She's got a water bit out the back. She literally just pops a watering can and comes in. So without further ado, we'll sort of start with what everybody grows in the greenhouse, which are tomatoes. She's got three tomatoes here and we've got some tomatoes over here, which I'm undecided whether to show you or not. She's growing in quite a peculiar way, but the three that I'm quite happy with the way she's growing, they're growing in a little grow bag. They're growing in these things called grow pots. They're slightly behind mine in the polytunnel, but I suspect that's more to do with the fact uh, that you get more fluctuation of temperatures in a small greenhouse, and that sometimes can slow things up slightly. You can see they look quite blue and strange. That's because uh, blight is quite prevalent. So these have been sprayed with Bordeaux mixture. You can buy Bordeaux mixture off the shelf. It's a copper-based spray, and it will prevent blight. But if your plants get it, as you could see on our potato video that we put up a couple of weeks ago, they've had it. So my mom's taken the decision that she will spray. Uh, she also, my mom uses slug pellets. She uses an organic slug pellet, but she does use slug pellets and that's her choice. But the tomatoes are doing okay. Some nice flowers on, some tomatoes at the back. And right next to those, she's growing her basil. Uh, they go together perfectly, don't they? Tomatoes and basil must be the best thing, you know, Fresh tomatoes, basil and mozzarella salad is to die for. Interestingly, basil originates in the Far East and tomatoes originate in South America. So why they should go together so perfectly, who knows? And she grows them in these small grow pots. And what's interesting about the small ones is they have this rim which stops the herbs falling in to where the water goes. And also what's quite interesting here is that you notice that the purple varieties of basil are never quite as strong as this one. This is um, Genovese basil, the classic basil for pesto. And just by touching them, you get that amazing aroma. And if you grow basil for the first time, you'll notice that it's thicker and sort of it feels slightly waxier than the stuff you buy. And it is so much more intense. There's so much more flavor in growing it yourself and dead easy in one of these little grow bags. You could grow, you know, enough basil in a grow bag just on your sort of patio or your balcony to keep you going and save yourself a fortune. So, and they grow together quite happily. And like I say, that's more or less what's in here. There's another chili here. I think it's a sweet pepper. We'll show you next time. And there's some tumbler tomatoes that we'll do a separate post on because I'm not exactly sure what they're growing in. She's got them dangling over here. And I'm sorry to keep you on sort of, uh, you know, not show you, but I promise we'll show you next week. I'm just not sure. I want to ask her what she's doing and why. The only other thing I'd like to mention while we're in here is this um, tie here, if we can come quite close in. This is um, 
a rubber, well it's not really a rubber, it's like a plasticky rubber tie that we use to tie things on. And what's good about this as opposed to string is there is a certain give in this. So as the tomato grows, it literally allows the tomato to expand. It doesn't cut into it. One of the problems you have if you tie tomatoes with string is you've got to remember to go back along your plants and let it off because if you don't it will cut into the stem and it will either sort of kill the tomato or let in disease so it could be worth getting hold of some of this i know simpson seed supply it and it's uh, probably where my mom got hers from i know she gets the tomato plants from simpson seeds and um, these are all growing just on like i say a, a bamboo frame that we've constructed in this greenhouse so that's the little six by eight foot greenhouse in the 10 minute garden. We'll now go outside and we'll sort of talk you through basically six beds are all we've got in this greenhouse, in this greenhouse. Six beds are all we've got in this little potager, six beds and a compost heap. And we'll sort of uh, show you what you can grow in an area that was probably half the size of an average urban back garden. I'm now standing in the potager. And a potage is just a French term for a little vegetable garden. And as we explained, the 10 minute garden is my mum's thoughts that at 80 years of age, she will only spend 10 minutes a day in this garden, whether that's watering, weeding, planting. So it's, it was a thought of what can we actually grow in 10 minutes a day. So the beds you can see, we've got three hexagonal beds. We've got three beds, which are about three feet by six. They're all no dig beds that which means that once they're prepared we don't dig them we weed them by hand um, the first one of the hexagonal beds the middle hexagonal bed is uh, our french bean bed and they're now about halfway up the sticks which is quite good they're in quite well i'm not too displeased with them one of them is quite stunted i think that one was hit by a slug uh, and if the top gets pinched out they never really get going as well uh, and what I did about seven days ago was actually go around and just put in six other beans. Uh, and a couple of those have just germinated and in a second we'll get in really close and I can show you those. And what that means is that they will grow up the same stick and they will extend the season. So when these run out of power, those will come in behind. And by planting two beans to each stick, you don't get the biggest crop you possibly could from each bean. You probably drop about 20% from each plant, but you're still up by 60%. So you get a longer season and you get a heavier crop by going around and putting that second bean on each of these sticks. The other thing it does is by lengthening the season, you're not desperately trying to eat all your beans at one go. Now I know with French beans, you can just let them get as big as possible and then we can dry them and use them in the winter in cassoulets, but it's still you know, quite a good thing to do. And the center of it is full of radish and they're coming along really nicely. And by the time they start to fill out and their leaves start to shade those radish, they'll be ready for eating. So that's the one bed and I'm quite happy with how that's going. So as you can see, you've got about a metre difference. This is six weeks of growth. This is seven days of growth. So that will give us about a month's longer cropping of young, fresh beans. Also, it takes into account that this bean that was hit by a slug and is really quite, you know, struggling and looks a bit runty. We'll leave it to see if it does any good, but if not, this is your backup. So whenever you grow beans or peas after about four to six weeks, just go around and put an extra one on each stick. It really does make a difference. This is one of the rectangular beds and these are our peas. And if we come right in, this is a great example of why you use pea sticks. They are brilliant with these long tendrils of winding their way through these sticks. They love this sort of structure wild peas grow through things and it's why pea sticks are brilliant for them. I'm quite happy with the way these peas are going in the bed and in front of them uh, here we have the leeks that we puddled in a couple of weeks ago and I deliberately have left this bed so if we focus right in you can see there's quite a few weeds between the rows these tiny little things and it's important that you get them out at this stage 
even a small weed of that size has a really big root. And if you don't get them out of this size, that root will get bigger and bigger. If you think there's normally more root under the ground than on top of it. But as you can see, it's hardly the most difficult thing in the world. It's just, you know, one of those things you have to do. And if you set yourself the task that 10 minutes one morning you're going to weed the bed, that's brilliant. And the other reason for spacing it regularly is that this here, that looks similar to a leek, isn't. That's grass. So that just needs to gently be removed out. If you wanted to do it even quicker, you could just use a spork and gently work your way along. You'll probably have to do this a couple of times because you won't disturb all the roots. But it certainly will. Whoa, what a beautiful spider. I don't know whether we can get that. Look at the stunning spider with a great big egg sack on the back. That's brilliant. Oh, I just, you know, that shows you your garden's working. If you're getting wildlife like this in it, that shows you you are creating an environment that things are happy and that is just terrific. Anyway, back to what we should be talking about. And you can very gently just work that through and pick off all these weeds. And of course, all those weeds are going to go straight into your compost bin. So that's one of the beds and I'm quite happy with how this is going. And I'll finish weeding this and then we'll talk about our beetroot bed and we'll also talk about the peas. This is one of the other hexagonal beds. This is the uh, pea bed and this has twice as many sticks as the beans. Uh, we've got a stick intermittent with the ones in the corners and in this one my mum grows sweet peas and peas. So on each corner we've got a sweet pea and in the centre we've got our peas growing up. These were late sown peas. Again we go back to that extending the season. These are to come in much much later in the season. And I think this is a really good example that even in a vegetable garden you want to feed your soul as well as your stomach. And sweet peas are my mum's favourite flower and she wants to grow them in a vegetable garden. And I think the other good thing is, is that they will attract lots of beneficial insects to your garden. So exactly the same way to make this wigwam, it's just you put the corners in and then you put the ones in the centre to grow your peas up. And uh, these are doing okay, we've got our first flower buds forming. I know a lot of people already are picking sweet peas, I've been picking them for ages. But these were planted direct um, about eight weeks ago, ten weeks ago, uh, you know, and it's not a race gardening is it? It's not who can get things first. It really should be about is it doing what you want and are you getting from it what you need, which is are you getting great tasting veg and are you sort of enjoying being out there? If those things aren't working for you then you should stop doing it. I get sick and tired of watching things where people go on and on, I'm a garden designer and you should be doing this. You know, listen to people who garden. What you should be doing is what makes you smile, not what they're telling you you should be doing because it's the right thing to do. There is no right and wrong. If you're enjoying doing it in your garden, it's absolutely right. If you want to fill your garden with garden gnomes, that's absolutely the right thing for you to do. Designers are there basically to blow hot air into the sky and get paid for blowing hot air. And good luck to them. You know, I have nothing against them really except they're fake tans, I suppose. Um, so what I'd say is choose to grow what you really enjoy. My mum enjoys sweet peas, so that's why we've got them in our pea bed. And last but not least in this update in the 10 minute garden, this is my favourite bed. I love this stuff. Now this really um, is just a beetroot bed. And what this is, it shows you the variety you can get from a single um, species. We've got at this end the classic beetroot. These are the beetroot that will go to about golf ball size. We'll then either roast them in the oven or steam them, eat them as a vegetable, or my favourite, I love freshly roasted beetroot and cheddar cheese sandwiches, although I would have to say uh, Godminster Cheddar. This is a small cheddar company in England. They make cheddar that I'm not sure how they make it so different and so exquisite, but they really do. I have nothing to do with Godminster. I've never had a free cheese from them, uh, but I'd be more than welcome if they're watching this video to accept them. But it's brilliant, so that's a beetroot. In front of it, 
we have bull's blood. Still a beetroot, but this one's been bred literally so that the leaves are what you use. You use these in salad, add lots of colour, lots of taste. Gorgeous. Now I know someone's going to put a comment saying you've picked it and eaten it, there could be all sorts of things on it. The one thing I know isn't on it are any chemicals. And trust me, if it's a choice between various pesticides and some pigeon pea, I'll go with a pigeon pea any day, it's hardly going to kill me. In front of that, we have Swiss chard. I love chard, it's sort of quite versatile. This just shows you the wonderful colour of this Jacob's Coat Swiss chard. You get pinks, you get reds, and you get this beautiful <coughs> golden colour. And as we've said, you can use the stems, chopped up really small and sautéed as a vegetable. And the leaves themselves do make a great substitute for spinach. Last but not least, another classic beetroot. This is bull's blood, really deep red, um, slightly stronger taste to it. Multiple sown, which means that there's probably a couple of seeds in each one of these. And as they grow, they'll push each other apart. So in a very small space, you've got a variety of four different things growing. The end, I think uh, we're going to put some small dwarf French beans. We'll pop those in in the next uh, day or so. So the next update in a couple of weeks from the 10 minute garden, you should be able to see those growing. So that's just sort of walked you around the greenhouse and the sort of pottinger to show you what, you know, my mom is growing in just 10 minutes a day. Uh, when I say my mum, to be brutally honest, I get to do the 10 minutes weeding, she gets to do the 10 minutes doing the watering. I suppose that's the deal, isn't it, when you're an only son? Anyway, I wouldn't change it. So, on that note, I'd just like to say, I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. Thanks for watching learnhowtogarden.com. Until next time, that's Mark saying bye for now.